everyone. So today I'm going to share about Pentecost and what it is. And I think that if you stick along and you watch this video, you're going to walk away so fascinated. It might be a little bit long, but I have all my notes and I'm just going to walk us through what Pentecost is and show how it ties the whole Bible together and how God is such a forward-thinking God, someone who's always thinking in advance and how his plan is perfect. Now, it might be long, but I encourage you to stay connected, watch this video, maybe get out your Bible, like let's go through this together because I promise that at the end, you'll be amazed by who he is and how intentional he is and everything. And before we start, I just want to say that the Bible says it is the glory of kings to search out a matter. There's things that are reserved for those who will take their time to lean in, to go a little bit deeper and seek the Lord and his ways. And if we are not always willing to take the time to really go deep, there's a lot of facets and attributes of God and revelation uh, of him that we get we will miss. So today I just want to encourage you to watch this, lean in, and get gain a greater revelation of the story of the Bible and of the greatness of our God. So what is Pentecost? We all know that Pentecost is coming up this Sunday and at the request of my mom because I love writing about appointed times, I am making this video, but Pentecost is an appointed time in the Bible. In the Bible, in Leviticus 22, I believe, we see seven appointed times of God. These are festivals that he has appointed and given the Jewish people, because those are the people he was in covenant with at the beginning, uh, instructions on how to celebrate these feasts. Now, when we celebrated Easter, we already went through three of them. We went through the Passover, we went through first fruits. And then now we're coming into Pentecost. And in between those was weeks, which is the counting down basically until the 50th day of Pentecost, which is what we're celebrating this Sunday. So I wanna talk about Pentecost, but before I get there, let's ask the question, what is an appointed time? In the Hebrew language, appointed time means moedim. And the word moedim is the same word that you would derive the word or the meaning that we get of tent of the meeting. This is when Moses would go to the tent of meeting and meet with God. So when we think of the word moedim or we think of appointed times, we are recognizing that God has created a tent of the meeting, a tent in time where we can meet with him and grow in a rev our revelation of him and just uh, seek him and there's a different kind of open heaven in that season of coming together and seeking him so right now we're in an appointed time pentecost is an appointed time where there's a tent that has been set in time to meet with god so i want to encourage you to lean in i know in the church we celebrate pentecost but what would it be like if we were to celebrate pentecost really understanding the significance of it so we know that on Pentecost in Acts 2 is when God pours his spirit out and it happens 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus descended, I mean, ascended into heaven the 40th day and for about 10 days, they were in the upper room seeking and pressing in to see the glory of God and receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said was going to happen. But why does this matter? Well, what's interesting to know is that the upper room is not the first Pentecost. The first Pentecost happened all the way in Exodus in Mount Sinai. So if we go to Exodus 19, we're going to see that the people of Israel are taken out of Egypt. That's the story. They exit from Egypt. They exit from slavery. And God is leading them to a place where they can dwell with him and have communion and covenant with him. So in Exodus 19, it says, Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. So they arrived at Mount Sinai. And this is believed to be the 40th day. And it says that while they're there, Moses goes up to the mountain and... Basically, God asked Moses a question. 
do you want to be, do you want to come into covenant with me? And this is what we see in verses three through six. It says, then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be a kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So what is happening here? God is telling Moses, I want to take you as my bride. I want to bring you into covenant. But here are the terms of conditions, the terms and the conditions. You have to obey me and keep my covenant. And so Moses is like, okay, this is the message God wants Moses to give to the Israelites. So he goes down to the mountain and he tells them in verse 7, it says, So Moses returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded them. And all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So they accepted the terms to, to the covenant. They said, yes, we want to be in relationship and in communion with God. We will obey. So Moses goes back up the mountain and he tells God, yes, the people said yes. And then God gives him terms of what they have to do. They have to prepare for, for Moses to go back up and consecrate themselves. And then it says, if we continue reading in Exodus 19 all the way to Exodus 20, we find that on the 10th day, God gives them the Ten Commandments. So God gives them the Word of God. Now, why is this significant? Because on the 40th day, Jesus ascended into heaven. Basically, humanity has been redeemed from slavery to sin and now Jesus ascends into heaven and the Jewish people are all in Jerusalem because on the appointed times they would come there was certain times that they would all come into Jerusalem to come and worship God Pentecost being one of them so the Jewish people are in Jerusalem the disciples go into the upper room as we read in Acts 1 and Acts 2 and they begin seeking the face of God and what happens on the 50th day they receive the Holy Spirit. So when we celebrate Pentecost, what are we celebrating? One, God giving us his word, and two, God giving us his spirit. Both are so important and so crucial. We can't just have the word without the Holy Spirit because without the Holy Spirit, we will lack the revelation and the power to obey the word, but also without the word, well, what is the Holy Spirit going to teach us and reveal? To us. The word is essential because the Holy Spirit reveals the word and the revelation of it. So we're in Exodus and we see that the people have received the Ten Commandments. God gives them to the people and they say in Exodus 20 verse 19 again they say, you speak to us and we will, um, they say that they're going to listen and follow the commands. And so then if you continue reading through Exodus 20 all the way through Exodus 31, Moses is up there on the mountain getting the instruction and the law from God. It's all explaining how to put, to build the tabernacle and everything. But then you get to Exodus 32 and something significant happens and changes everything. In verse 8 of Exodus 32, this is what it says. The Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain, your people whom you brought them brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So what is happening here? Moses was up in the mountain. He went back up to the mountain as God is revealing and giving him more information, releasing the word. And the people are getting impatient. Moses hasn't come down. So at the beginning of Exodus 32, they turn to Aaron, Moses' brother, and they ask, make us a God, make us somebody that we can worship, somebody that we can see. Like we're worried about Moses. He's probably dead. That's probably done and over with. We need a God. So what do they do? Out of all of the stuff that they got, that they brought from Egypt, the, the gold and all of those things, they create a calf 
to worship. And God sees what they're doing. He tells Moses, hurry, go down, look at what they're doing. And he says, look how quickly they have turned from me. What did they do? They broke the covenant they made with God. And they broke the first command, which in the Ten Commandments, what does it say? That thou shalt not have any other God before me. So by having an idol, they broke covenant with God. And we see how God is so angry. He calls them stubborn people, rebellious people. And he says that he is going to, he's going to destroy them. Verse 10, it says, Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. Verse 11, But Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. O oh Lord, he said, Why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? So he begins interceding on the behalf of the people of Israel. And in verse 14, it says, So the Lord changed his mind about this terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. So the Lord has mercy on the people of Israel, and he decides that he is not going to destroy them. And then, so he relents, and he continues giving the information in Exodus, if you follow through, of how to build the tabernacle, the place where his glory is going to reside. But there's something so significant, because by the time you get to the end of Exodus, we get to Exodus 40 when the tabernacle is completed and when the glory of God fills the place. But there's something so remorseful and sorrowful about this moment. The nation that was supposed to have access to God, that was supposed to be able to walk in close covenant relationship with him, because they broke the covenant and they sinned, they fell short of the glory of God. The Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? We fall short of his presence. Because of our sin, we cannot enter into his presence. And so in Exodus 40, when the temple tabernacle is completed and the glory of God falls, it says, verse 34 and 35, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So, Moses didn't have access into the holy place of God, into his presence. The representative, not even the representative of Israel, could enter the tabernacle because their sin um, caused them to lose what they had access to. And it follows the same pattern in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, they lost access to his presence. And that's such a sorrowful thing because all God wants to do is dwell with us. When he said that he was going to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt, he said that he was going to bring them into a place where they could worship him. Well, what does it mean to worship? It means to have communion with God. And when we create a place of worship and we begin to worship God, what happens? God begins to minister to us and he begins to host us. We think we're hosting him, but then he comes into the room and hosts us. So there's a communion relationship that happens. So Two times, it was already broken, God's plan. Uh, he wanted to have communion in the garden, they sinned. He wanted to have communion with the, the, the nation of Israel, and they sinned. But then we enter Leviticus, and the solution, the temporary solution, is God raises up Levites. He raises up priests who will be representatives for the people of Israel before him, and for him before the people of Israel. And that's when we go into Leviticus and Numbers, and you see the priests are going to be creating the tabernacle, living in the tabernacle, creating sacrifices, and things like that. But it wasn't the thing that God wanted. He wanted something so that all of us could walk in intimacy with him, and all of us could have access to him. So if through the prophet Jeremiah, we see that there is still hope. I want to read Jeremiah 31. I'm going to start in verse 31, and this is what it says. This covenant, no, let me say it. 31, start all over. It says, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will be not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife. You see, God was bringing them into a covenant, like a marriage covenant with them, but they broke the terms of the covenant. Verse 33, it says, But this is the new covenant. 
I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. So what do we see here? God still has the desire to bring us into covenant. It's the plan and the purpose that he plans since before the foundations of the earth. In Ephesians 1, it says that before the earth was formed, God made covenant with himself to bring us and to his family to bring to cause us to be holy and blameless he wants to create covenant with us each one and, and individually personally and intimately and so that brings jesus into the story jesus arrives and if we go to the last supper which the last supper is happening happens on passover and Jesus is presenting himself as the Passover lamb saying, I'm going to give my body and my blood for you on your behalf so that I can pay for the redemption and the forgiveness of your sins. And Luke 20 verse 20 says, After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So this shows how Jesus is so involved in our redemption. He desires covenant with us. He said, I'm going to make a new covenant. And then Jesus comes in the New Testament. We see him come and he says, I'm going to make this possible by offering my body and my blood on your behalf. And his blood and his body confirms the new covenant. So on the Last Supper, he is, he, um, presents himself as a Passover lamb. And again, this takes us back to Egypt because in Egypt, God told the Israelites, put blood over your doors and I will pass over it, and you will not have to pay the penalty that everybody else in Egypt is going to pay. The blood will distinguish you. And it's the blood of Jesus that when we receive him for ourselves and our lives, that distinguishes us so that at the end of our life, we won't have to pay the penalty of our sin because Jesus did. But it doesn't end at Passover. Passover is the beginning. It's the beginning of our redemption. But there has to be more to it. The same way that when Israel came out of Egypt, they were redeemed from Egypt, but they still had to get Egypt out of them because they were still living as slaves. And so we there still needs a progression of things to happen. So first, Jesus has to raise up from the grave. So on Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate his resurrection. He is the first fruits. That's another point of time. We celebrate first fruits. And if we go to Romans 8, 29, it doesn't plan to read it, but let's read it. If we go to Romans 8, 29, this is what it says. It says, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. On Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead and that he is the first of many. And that means that we have been destined to become like him, to walk in his same likeness. And so he he rises, he raises up, he rises from the dead, he's resurrected. And first of all, this legitima, legitimizes everything Jesus said that shows us that he is worthy of forgiving us of our sins because death could not hold him. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. But if there is no sin on him, then death is not his inheritance nor his portion. He can't be kept in the grave. If you look at Acts 2.24, death couldn't hold him. So we see that Jesus is the first fruits. That means he's a picture of what we get. We're going to be able to walk in as a new creation. We're going to be like him. So our walk with God is us being transformed in his likeness. So first in Mount Sinai, the people were given a law and they couldn't keep it because they still had not received that, that they were not a new creation yet. And God in his perfect um, plan creates a way for us to be made whole again. And through Jesus, we become a new creation and we begin the process of transformation and sanctification where we begin to walk in his likeness. But it's only made possible through the Holy Spirit. Because you see, we all saw the disciples when we read the Bible. 
and then we see a huge contrast from the way that they were to the way they are now when they were walking under the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, do not go and preach the word until you receive the Holy Spirit. Stay in the upper room until you receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is essential for us to be able to walk in our new identity and to receive our new identity. We cannot do this walk without the Holy Spirit because without him, we lack the revelation and we lack the transformation that we need. Second Corinthians 3.18 says that by the Spirit, we are continually being transformed into the glory of Jesus, into the likeness of Jesus. So we need the Holy Spirit. We can't just live by the word because the Bible says that the, 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 the law kills but the Spirit gives life. And so we need the Holy Spirit to be able to experience and live by the power of, of, of Jesus and experience the power of his resurrection in our own lives. So we see Jesus is raised to, the death, raised to life from death. So it legitimizes what he said. We are forgiven. We are now in a new covenant. And then Jesus ascends and he says, when I ascend, you can receive the Holy Spirit. And if we go to Acts 2, we see that the Holy Spirit, as they're all in one room and one accord, praying and seeking God, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit falls on them like what? As tongues of fire. And why is this significant? Because in Mount Sinai, when they were receiving the word from God, the whole mountain was on fire. And now individuals in Acts 2 have tongues of fire, pillars of fire upon them. And what is happening? They're receiving the Holy Spirit and the, the completion of this new covenant is being brought to them. And guess what? Just like Jesus, God said through Jeremiah that he was going to write a new covenant on their hearts, they now no longer just have the Torah externally in a tablet or in the words, but it is now written in their hearts. And let me read to you Hebrews 10, 4, 15, it says, And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, This is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their hearts and minds. So when they receive the Holy Spirit, they receive the word of God written on their hearts. And so this is how they can walk and love the Lord their God with all our hearts. This is how we get to love God, by receiving the Holy Spirit. You see, nothing is done in our own strength. In our walk with God, everything has to be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. I know we think that sometimes we still, we're still living in our slavery mentality, that we're still sinners. But when we get saved, we're no longer sinners. We are a new creation. And a lot of times people like to compare Romans 7 and Romans 8. And in Romans 7, it's talking about when Paul's saying, I keep doing the thing that I don't want to do. But what Paul's saying is, he's not saying that that's how he lives. He's saying the person who lives, tries to live as a new creation without the power of the Holy Spirit experiences this kind of problem. They keep doing the thing that they don't want to do. But in Romans 8, they have the power to overcome because of the Holy Spirit. They have the power to overcome sin because of Him. They have the power to walk as a new creation because of the Holy Spirit. So in Pen on Pentecost, what are we receiving? The Word of God. We're celebrating the receiving the Word of God, Mount Sinai, but also receiving the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to live it out and to walk in holiness. And we receive our new identity that we are a new creation in Christ. Why? Because the Holy Spirit came into the room and he fell on them like pillars of fire. It represents the anointing. In the Old Testament, who received the anointing? Who received the Holy Spirit? It was only for a select few. It was for priests and it was for prophets and it was for kings. And these were all meant to do the work of God. Now I know we read in 1 Kings and 2 Kings that there are some kings who didn't do the work of God. But that's what the kings were put in place for, to be a representative and to represent God to the people. So the select few got anointed so that they could do the work of God. But in Acts, everybody got anointed. Everybody received the empowerment from the Holy Spirit. And that's what makes them good witnesses of the, word, of the work of God. And that's 
that's what says gives him the freedom to be able to proclaim his word with power. And so you know what that means that now not just the select are few, but now all of us are priests before for the glory and honor of God. I want to read First Peter two nine, and this is what it says. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who you called out of darkness and to his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, what does this sound like? Do you remember in Exodus 19 when God made covenant was making covenant with the people of Israel he said I was going to create you I want to create you into a royal priesthood into a holy nation but they could not accomplish it on their own they could not receive that new identity on their own they kept on sinning they sinned and and they they lost that privilege and not only the few select had it but because of Jesus and the finished work of the cross and what he did and because he ascended so that we could receive the Holy Spirit, now all of us can become and be this royal priesthood, this chosen generation. This is our new identity. We're no longer sinners. We have the righteousness of God. We are being transformed into his likeness. We can overcome sin and we can be effective witnesses for the glory of God because of the Holy Spirit. We need both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. We can't do live by the Word if we don't have the Holy Spirit. We have to live by the Spirit who makes us, um, allows us to complete the Word of God. So on Pentecost, we get to see how God's Word just wraps well, so well together and how we have everything we need to fulfill and accomplish and do the good works that God has called us to do long ago. We're no longer slaves. We're no longer people who are lost to the mindset of slavery. But if we give ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we can be transformed into this new identity. Because in, in Exodus, the Israelites still had Egypt in them. They had to get Egypt removed. But us in the new covenant, because we have the Holy Spirit, we're a new creation. We don't have to walk as slaves or with that mindset anymore. We're completely changed and we have everything we need to walk in power. Why do we resort to a form of godliness without power? The Bible, the Bible shows us that we can walk and do the things Jesus did. Jesus was divine in identity, but on the earth, he walked as a human. and Everything he did was by the power of the Holy Spirit. That same spirit lives in us. That same spirit guides us. That same spirit is for us. That same spirit intercedes and prays for us on our behalf. He is literally everything, God with us, God for us. It's a miracle that he dwells within us. And on Pentecost, we remember that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And because of him, we can walk in victory. We don't have to walk in our own strength because it's not by power it's not by might but it's by the spirit says god so we have such a great gift in the holy spirit and what would happen if we would just yield our lives to the leading of the holy spirit if we would receive him and allow him to take the lead what kind of impact could we make for the glory of god what kind of peace could we live in? Look at Jesus and look how he lived. Look at the impact he made and look at the peace that he had. It was all because he trusted the Holy Spirit. He trusted the Holy Spirit to the point of death. He trusted that he would raise him up from the dead. And you know what? Every day as we walk with God and yield to the Holy Spirit, he's resurrecting us and saving us and transforming us. We need him. We can't just live the word and try to fulfill the word in our own strength. And why why would we even try when we've already been given the gift of the Holy Spirit? So I hope that encouraged you. Um, I just wanted to show how everything is so intricately intricately brought together. How God the like God didn't just save us. He didn't just redeem us, but he redeemed us unto doing good works. He redeemed us unto being a priest. And we get to do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have everything that we need. We are not orphans. We are not helpless. We are not victims. We are not slaves. We are sons and daughters of the King who have been equipped, 
for such a time as this. So I hope that as you go into Pentecost, as we go into Sunday, that you'll get yourself to church and you receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Be grateful for him. Ask him to reveal himself to you through his word and the gift that he is. And let's all surrender into much greater depths to the Holy Spirit so that he could truly reign over our lives, rest on us, and do the work of the Father and glorify the Father by the lives that we live. So if you watched, thank you for watching. I know it was long.